Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirabbil alamin. Assalatu wassalamu wa ambiyal mursalin. Allahumma salli ala sayidina Muhammad wa ali makhluk wal khatim ma sabak nasral haq bi haq wa hadil siratal mustaqim ala alihi haqqan daril azim. Alhamdulillah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh everyone wherever you are. May peace be upon you. We pray that you are in good health, well-being and insyaallah in the state of good iman. Amin. Tonight welcome again to another episode of a uh, Sud Ilahi Life and mashallah tonight we discuss something that is very important for all of us why reading matters and we have a beautiful and blessed guest tonight uh, none other than uh, Mr Ibrahim Tahir or we always call him Ibrahim Warda the owner of Rada Books right uh, a bit about him before we start this uh, interview right uh, Ibrahim Tahir is the owner of Warda Books in his work as a bookseller and with his background as an editor he has experienced many aspects of the book industry in the course of all this he has developed a mission and purpose in the promoting of reading mashallah this see we have the right man here for tonight so let us welcome uh, ibrahim mashallah cd ibrahim mashallah assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh waalaikumsalam boss how are you Thank you, Khalid, for inviting us. Uh, uh, I think Warda <laughs> is is very happy to be uh, working closely with Sawilahi. Thank uh, you. We've been cooperating uh, since the beginning. Yeah, inshallah, inshallah. Uh, I think uh, all of us actually uh, looking forward to tonight to learn about reading from you, inshallah. You know, um, knowing you for so long. Right, uh, I think 21 years, inshallah. Even before Warda exists as a bookstore, uh, I remember you running Warda as a online way of people ordering, which is today also, but today plus the bookstore, inshallah. Allah preserve all of you for the good work. Um, you said that I remember you said that you did this because you wanted people uh, to start reading books. I find it very profound because that hit me actually, really hit me, and that's how I started to read back again. Because when I was young, my father, my late father, always said read any book. So we, were, my, my my late mother, will bring us to mobile library. You know, last time they have this mobile library. And after that, of course, along the way, I lost it. But until I met you, and you were telling me about the importance of reading right so in all this and it's amazing that to find someone wanting to run a bookstore for the purpose of people you know having that uh what you call it uh urging people to read and create that space for society you know to start reading how important it is for people to read uh, yeah, it's, it's true. Alhamdulillah, um, we started Warda, myself and uh, my wife, Makhaini, uh, way back uh, on the corner of North Beach Road. And if, from, from really early on, our focus was on reading. Uh, um, not so much, well, definitely in, at the beginning, uh, not, not so much on the... Uh, retail side of things, uh, because our primary concern when we started out was was activism, uh, was to get uh, people to read and to bring um, books that uh, were valuable to our community. Uh. So that was how we started. Uh, and I think that's how we, we've carried on uh, through the ups and downs of um, business. But to, I mean, to go back to the heart of the question today, um, you you themed the the discussion why reading matters. Maybe it's instructive to start with definitions. Um, so the first thing we ask is what is reading? At a very uh, simple level, reading is the decoding of written characters in order to gain meaning. That's the first level of reading. And one of my favorite writers is Julian Barnes. Uh, he writes fiction. 
Uh, he said that reading is a majority skill, but a minority art, meaning that everyone can read, but few people read well, or put it another way, few people want to read well, and fewer still um, read deeply and read actively, because it takes effort. For me, I am more focused, uh, obviously, on deep reading, uh, because it's a kind of reading that allows us to access knowledge and from there access beauty and truth. I'm not referring to the type of reading that we do on social media on, or on our screens. I'm aware I'm, I'm on Facebook now, but I'm not referring to that kind of reading because that kind of reading is basically scanning. We go through text as fast as, as possible and because we want to get to the comment section below. This uh, is the reading that happens uh, for dopamine addicts. This is, this is the kind of reading uh, that is, I'm not referring to this kind of reading because this is the kind of reading that is uh, emotional. It excites um, our emotional centers of, uh, to react and to judge. And it does not take a lot of intellectual effort. And we form, as I said, we form judgments quickly uh, when we read this way. And, and then we move on to other things. Um, the what we've, we've read does not affect us uh, deeply because we did not put in any effort in it in the first place. So this is not the kind of reading I'm talking about. What I am talking about is deep reading. Deep reading does not come naturally to anyone. You have to work at it. So now we come to the other part of the, of the question that needs defining uh, why it matters. And here I, I, I go back to Julian Barnes again. Uh, because he said that reading is a communion between absent author and entranced present reader. So I say, say that again. Reading is a communion, it's a coming together between absent author and present reader. Now this is important. It means that the reader who is present can be granted an audience with the greatest minds of our civilization. You can sit down with anyone from uh, Aristotle to Ibn Sina, or from Ibn Arabi to Al-Ghazali. And the connection you have with these authors is immediate and tangible. This is the gift of active reading by the present reader, the reader who makes himself present to the text. And Professor Khalid Abu Fadl, uh, who we've met, who, who, who came to Warda many years ago and is possibly the biggest bibliophile in the Muslim world. And he reads a lot. But anyway, Khalid Fadl did this quite literally, this communion uh, between reader and author. He did this quite literally um, as a device in his book, The Conference of the Birds, of The Conference of the Books, The Search for Beauty in Islam. And notice that uh, Khalid Abu Fadl linked this communion between author and, uh, and reader with the search for beauty. Because the full title is the conference of the books, the search for beauty in Islam. So in our tradition, beauty at the metaphysical level is indistinguishable from truth. Truth is beauty, beauty is truth. Sure. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Huh? We are still in definitions. So there's another term to define. And this is a term that is not in the statement why reading matters. Uh, it is, uh, it, but it, it is a term that requires definition. And it is, what is a book? Because I'm a bookseller. So the, the, the reading happens with books. So let's scope the discussion to books. So what is a book? If you come to Warda after closing hours, you will notice that the shutters are down. And on the shutters, I had put uh, a definition of what books are. And this definition I took from uh, Andrew Haslam uh, in his book on book design. The title of the book is just called Book Design. And it's a wonderful book. And in this book, he defines um, what is a book. And his definition is books are portable containers consisting of printed and bound pages that preserves, announces, 
expounds and transmits knowledge to a literate readership across time and space. So reading, or oh, sorry, uh, books are a technology that enables us to transcend space and time. Because again, there's the communion between the author and the present reader. And the technology of the book uh, allows us to do this. And <laughs> I'll quote another author, and this is uh, the Italian uh, author, Umberto Eco, who said that the, the book is like a spoon. It is, it is uh, a technology that is so simple, is yet its simplicity and its ubiquity is its power. You have books everywhere, and you have books that are easy, and books are easily accessible. This is the power of the books. This is the technology that, that books has. Uh, that allows it to be a container of ideas, potentialities um, that are unspooled in the mind of the, of the reader, of the present reader, of a reader who is willing to commit the time and to commit his, his, the energy of his mind uh, in order to uncover uh, knowledge and, has, and would have then uh, access to beauty and to truth, as Khalid Wafadil says. So with this definition out of the way, let's visit the, the whole of tonight's theme is why reading matters. So the short answer is this, reading matters because without it, civilization will collapse. When people do not read deeply, they are not habituating themselves to nourishing the mind and the intellect they are not habituating themselves to beauty and truth. I'm not talking about the, the more metaphysical or spiritual aspects of beauty and truth, because this is outside the scope of what we're discussing. As I was saying, people who do not read are not habituating themselves to knowledge, beauty and truth. And when this happens at the population level, my thesis is that civilization, civilization collapses. Now, this is, a, this is quite a statement. So let me illustrate what happens uh, when a typical reader reads a book. So let's draw down to the individual reader. What happens when this reader reads a book? First, he selects a book uh, to read on a subject of his choice. So there is will at play here. And the will intends to access knowledge. So far, so good. Then the reader sits down and opens the book and immediately the voice of the other person, the author, takes presence in his mind. And the person is attentive. You are receptive. You are alive to the possibilities of knowledge. The absent author and the present reader coming into communion, just like Julian Barnes says. And, and the reader learns to be present. Now, the voice of the author goes on, and with it, fragments of ideas form in the reader's mind. And you arrange these ideas into a logical sequence. If you're and if you're reading fiction, you arrange these ideas into a narrative sequence of a story, beginning, middle, and end. In the case of poetry, you arrange or juxtapose ideas to form new levels of meaning, meanings that you, you never considered before. And you learn to manipulate abstract ideas in your mind to create new ideas. You change your mind. You negotiate. Uh, you argue your case. And crucially, you also argue the case on behalf of someone else. In this case, on behalf of the author. You become an advocate of ideas. And if you read fiction, you learn a sort of dynamic, compassionate empathy for the other and other that you have not met, that you only met uh, on the pages of a book. Then, while all this is happening, the reader considers his own life and considers his own experiences and what he has learned and compares what he has read with what the author is speaking about. There is analysis and there is also synthesis. You learn to build from what you know. You learn to utilize knowledge and incorporate this knowledge into your own body of knowledge. 
this is the crux of lifelong learning that we always hear about. But that's not all. Uh, because the reader is sitting still, physically sitting still, listening to a voice of another whom he may agree or may disagree. But he carries on, the reader carries on, he lets the uh, author finish. Uh, he's listening to the other, to the author for hours, for days sometimes, over hundreds of pages. So you learn attentiveness and you learn to be still. And all this is just one step away from meditation and deep reflection. I remember um, many years ago and the recently deceased um, Prof Malik Badri, uh, I, was, I had the privilege of uh, meeting him and he was talking about contemplation and meditation in Islam. And I remember he was talking about, uh, because he's from Sudan and he was talking about the, the Nile River, the, where the White Nile meets with the cataracts of the Black Nile. And he was saying that uh, that view uh, in his home uh, always brings him to a state of contemplation. So after the event, I, I went up and, and asked him uh, whether deep reading uh, is like meditation. And he said, of course, it is. And this is important uh, because in our tradition, uh, we know that a moment's reflection or meditation is greater than 70 years of worship. So this is not something trivial. And books uh, are a very accessible way for us to, to reach there. So, so the question is, do you wish to be present? Do you wish to be an advocate of ideas? Do you wish to have this dynamic, compassionate empathy for the other? And do you wish to have a life full of learning? Do you wish to have the tools to reflect and meditate? So with all this in mind for the individual reader, what do you think if every member of society is able to do this, is able to actualize all this? How great is your civilization, your society, your schools, your, your nation? But if no one does this, no one in your society reads, uh, no one is able to be present, no one is able to advocate ideas, uh, no one is able to practice compassion in the laboratory of the mind. Uh, and they don't have this, this practice of lifelong learning because at the heart of it, uh, reading is the proof of someone wanting to learn and wanting to access to truth and beauty. So at the society level, if we do not have this, how long do you think civilization will last? So that, that's my, that's my, that's how I think about it, um, that reading matters absolutely. So, I mean, if, if you see someone uh, reading a book, uh, sitting down in the corner reading a book, and you are on Facebook or social media arguing with someone, perhaps you should have the awareness that the one that is doing uh, more work is the one that is actively reading and changing themselves and changing the world. This is why reading matters. So that's my opening statement. Mashallah, so profound. So many at many different levels to show how important reading is uh, and i remember you said that many years ago to me also when you first started warda and i think this is something that we are completely lacking and not understanding the reality of reading uh. the, the the thing is i i did start out now uh, with this idea uh, for warda 20 years ago but over the years uh, the the issue has become even more urgent um, because back then we did not realize um, how serious um, the fall in reading uh, would, would happen in our society. Yeah. And the, the effects are, are all there for you to see. Yeah. Um, 
there's one there's one writer called Frank Furedi, and to him he says the reason why people are not reading anymore is because they do not value truth. Allah. <laughs> so when oh. a society does not value truth, um, and this he wrote this before uh, this whole talk about a post-truth era. So he was talking about how people are no longer valuing truth. And so if you don't value truth, you do not seek truth. And if you do not seek truth, you do not um, take the steps in order to reach truth. Mm -hmm. And one of the rudimentary ways to, to, to reach truth or learning is reading. So it's, it's, quite, it's quite a concern. And this concern... For for me and for us, uh, the booksellers at, at Warda and and I've spoken to the people at the National Library and all that uh, within Singapore. It is it is quite a concern, um, and also educators. This is this is quite a concern when uh, a, a, our society, which is which is literate, are functionally illiterate because we we choose not to read and we choose not to read uh, with attention and with the with the intention to reach truth. Inshallah. I is like mesmerized. <laughs> yeah, but I think there's so many layers of it that you said, which is the truth itself. Mm. I think this kind of thing can make as a as a workshop by itself. <laughs> yeah, I, you don't need a workshop. All, all you need to do is to pick up a book and um, and dive right in. Uh, <laughs> yeah, dive in. That's the key. Uh. You see, I think you mentioned about social media, mm. you mentioned about the effect of it, uh, and also the the fact that how it, how we don't realize that reading a book is much more important than spending on social media. Yes. Yeah. Because the, 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 the brain is a very plastic, mm. the, the brain is very adaptable. Um, uh, so, when when it is habituated to something, it's habituated to to to, to truth and to seeking knowledge, then uh, the whole brain is is conforms to that um, orientation. We, I'm just talking about the brain. I'm not talking about yeah. the soul yet. But I'm <laughs> sure there's a lot of implications for for the spirit and for your ego and all these things. But our our sphere is the intellect, and the intellect has to be nourished. Um, uh, an intellect that is not fed dies. It's as simple as that. So this, this is this is a matter of great concern uh, yeah, to yeah. all of us. Yeah. Interesting also because just now also when you were describing about why reading matters, you mentioned about when you read a book, the author is talking to you yes. and you are reflecting Mohasaba, uh, yes. the late professor, Dr. Malik Badri also was talking about it, right? And uh, dive in, uh, like what you said, right? So there's the, a lot. The, the 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 thing is, we do not. We have a lot of our uh, a lot of us. We have lost faith in 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 the medium, um, because we we do not we see it as something trivial, uh, um, reading, mm. and it's something kids do. I remember I was uh, I was. I think I was at a bus stop. I think many many years ago, and I was reading. Then this 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 elderly lady was so curious. And she spoke to me because in our culture, very rare for people to speak to strangers. She spoke to me and then said, "Boy, what are you reading?" I said, "I'm reading a book." I said, then then she said, "You so old, you still uh, in school?" I said, no, I'm not in school. I'm, I'm reading. I'm reading something I'm interested in. So she was generally um, curious. Uh, but anyway, that, that, that's beside the point. What, what I was trying to get at is that we need to trust the medium of the book. Uh, we need to uh, know that the while the book is simple, accessible, um, it is not something um, that can be dismissed uh, as um, as trivial. Um, that's, that's both the power and the weakness of the book. The power of the book is, is extremely accessible. Uh, and the weakness of it is that because it's so ubiquitous, uh, people think that is nothing. Yeah, I think it's also the reflection of materialism also. Like. 
Yeah, but I think the diving part just now you were talking about the absorbing, right? Is you are absorbing by the book, the author, the author speaks to you, and your mind contemplate, your heart reflects, and everything goes on. But there are also people who trying their best to have the level of deep reading, as you mentioned, right? And now uh, maybe we we can start from here, Sola, a bit sure. tips, advice from you. How do we get there to to have that? Uh, deep reading that, that that steps that we need to take uh, you know like full yeah, you, concentration you, on you, it, yeah you you can't run a marathon on your first try yeah. mm -hmm. so you you need to um, build up to it uh, you need to practice it uh, and you you need to just do it every day and you get better at it uh. um, yeah if people start by walking and then they start brisk walking and then eventually they can run marathons. Uh. Um, this is the body. The body is able to adapt to the to the needs of the of the person. The mind is the same. It is able to adapt much faster. In fact, the the challenge uh, for us is is actually uh, distraction. Um, because and this is this is why I always advocate. Yeah, that's the thing. This is why I always advocate reading on on print media on on books. Because books, um, books only do one thing. Uh, they only mm -hmm. present text, line after line after line of text. So, so your, your attention is very focused. You know, there's the next line, there's the next line, and then there's the next page. Uh, not the same with the screen, because the screen is a dispersion machine, is, is a distraction machine. The notification, notification the alerts, the different colors, the flashing things. Everything demands your attention. So uh, reading, if you're trying to read uh, deeply on the screen, um, studies have shown that this is not uh, possible. Uh, even uh, to the point that, that um, Nicholas Carr was saying that even to the point where even if you have your phone screen off mm -hmm. uh, on the table and you're reading the book, the gravitational pull of the device is so strong yeah. that it tugs at your consciousness because, yeah. because you depend so much on, on, the, on the book. Eh, sorry, you depend so much on the device yeah. for your work, for your entertainment, for your everything, or your connection. Connection is very important to us. Mm -hmm. So there is the, 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 the device has a gravitational pull. And it tugs at us, uh, even when we're trying to, to read and trying to, to push it away. Because the, the effort of pushing away distraction also takes a toll on the brain. Um, yes. It also takes a toll on our ability to read. So that's one thing that we need to sort out. Uh, how, how we uh, eliminate uh, distractions from, from the brain. So that, that's all extremely challenging. And I, I, I sympathize. Yeah, you're talking about me also, actually. Ever since uh, social media, right? When I read, I tend to doze off or sleep. Uh. But with social media, I tend to be active, like, you know. And this is the reality we're facing. Uh. And this is the, I think, one of the biggest jihad that I'm facing and going through it. Uh. But, Angela, thank you for your explanation. But, but how is it that uh, for someone, right, who has short, attention span at least uh, for your uh, for your experience and your expertise uh, expertise on this at least how, how should one start to read let's say how many minutes at least uh. should it should be um half an hour at least uh of just of just reading to start with anything less than half an hour is a bit of a no it, it has to be at least half an hour yeah. So uh, and that half an hour is is to to get through the book with as little distractions as as you can, uh. um, because it's all about about giving your attention, and not I mean I I've spoke about uh, how important it is to the to the mind uh, of and for the intellect, but just imagine um, if for someone who is able to be present and is able to concentrate and push away distractions mm -hmm. that's imagine how 
uh, interesting that person will be uh, to have a conversation with, uh, to have a relationship with, uh, to have to to confide in uh, someone who pays attention to you. So, in in various aspects of life, uh, it is important to have someone who pays attention. And uh, unfortunately, our media um, environment uh, encourages us to be dispersed. So that's why sometimes it's, it's hard. Even when you're talking to a, a good friend, um, a notification comes in or whatever comes in and he, he does not um, give you your due attention. So reading does affect um, other things in your life. Yeah, like I'm experiencing now all the messages coming in. Precisely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think some people are still asking uh, why I've not asked questions. We are relaxed. We are having this conversation. So for those who want to ask questions, relevant question about reading, okay, reading, why reading matters, or maybe also how to read a book, this is the expert here. So message me at 906-87106. Relevant question. Irrelevant, I'm sorry. I have to say forward to you i'm not gonna ask right so uh just now you you i i, I remember and i recall also from some um who and also some uh how you call it those who deal with psychology and so on they always encourage writing and reading ah yes uh, thank you so much for bringing that up yeah um you <laughs> Because uh, to me, um, writing and reading go hand in hand. Uh, they're two wings of a, of, a, of a bird. So definitely, yes. Um, you have the, the input of the reading and it has to come out in, in, in the writing. Uh. And the, like, if I can share some of my own yeah. practice. Um, sure. I write every day. Inshallah. Um, and... Uh, I write a few pages every day, uh, every morning. Uh, that's that's my practice, uh. um, and it can be on any subject. It can be on the weirder subject. It can be on no subject. Um, but the is a discipline uh, to to do to to do it uh. every. The first thing in in the morning is 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 after your usual things that you do in the morning. You, the the biggest activity is is, is um, writing, uh. and then. I read. I read you, morning. you write on the paper or your book or on the computer? I write, uh, I write in, uh, in a book, yes. Yeah. So like a diary? Uh. It's like a diary, but uh, it can be anything. Uh. It can be what, what happened yesterday, what is going to happen tomorrow, what am I thinking about? And, and all the, like a lot of the, the, the newsletters uh, that I sent out uh, to, to the customers of Warda, uh, a lot of those ideas uh, come uh, from those ruminations when when I write in my diary. So it's fragments of ideas um, that are completely random, uh, but they are strung together by uh, when I formally write. So to me, reading and writing go to, go hand in hand, and and I write uh, notes as well. Um, Besides the journaling thing, when when I read, especially if I read uh, nonfiction, mm -hmm. I I write notes uh, when I'm reading. It slows down the process quite a lot, mm -hmm. um, but th that's kind of the point. Uh, so I read, and then I write sort of reflections of what I'm reading. Sometimes I go off on tangents, and mm -hmm. I just just write what the tangent is. And at the end of the chapter, I sort of summarize the chapter. And then um, after I've read the whole book, I look at all my notes again and I, and I write a, a long reflection of the book. So in that way, the, the book stays with me um, longer. Okay. I'm able to recall stuff from the book because I spend a lot of time with the books. That, that's for non-fiction. For fiction, I, I don't really take notes. Uh. Um, I still read a lot of fiction. Some people are surprised by that, but I read a lot of fiction. So is there a difference or not? Because now you're talking about dive deep, 
uh, into it is there a difference between uh, reading something that is uh, the truth like you mentioned the truth yeah and also fictional as someone who love history right i always love to uh, read history books uh. i mean i force myself to read because yeah. i love history and warda has become like uh, a door to me ever since 2004 right you bring yeah. a lot of books around the world or scholars write about the history of bosnia or whatever ottoman so i saw that like a like a, a lens to the world itself in the bookstore so is there a huge differences or it's okay just read the book Yeah, uh, yeah, there is a difference between uh, non-fiction and fiction, of course. Uh, as I said, I I pay a lot more attention when I'm reading non-fiction um, because I'm trying to follow the arguments of the of the writer and all that. But for fiction, uh, it's best that you just lose yourself in the story. But fiction may not be based on fact or reality, but that does not mean that there are no glimmers of truth. Uh, especially in like yeah a, a lot of a lot of um, writing will not be good writing if it's completely false uh, or there's no truth value in in any of the stories uh, so a lot of the things that are explored uh, do revolve around truth and beauty and certainly with poetry there's a lot of beauty there And 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 that's and that's the thing for for poetry. Uh, in order for you to appreciate um, the beauty of the words, must bear in mind that that poets, uh, people who write poetry, agonize over the the placing of words, one word after the other. They agonize over. They 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 take weeks and years just to craft a sentence that is maybe just three words. And uh, we need to give that due attention, uh, because when we give the attention, then we can see the layers, and the meanings, and the. It's, it's just beautiful. Uh. So, whether it's fiction or it's non-fiction, uh, that it doesn't mean that your. There's a difference in the access to truth. There, there is some glimmers of truth. Uh, sure. Yeah. Beautiful. I think. Uh, how about some someone uh, like someone like me lah? I cannot write well as well as you and a lot of people. So, but always have this reflective after reading books and all that. Yeah. So should I still write and get someone to edit or just write? No, 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 no. No, you you should write for yourself. Um, you should when when you when you read a book and you feel compelled to write, as most people uh, do. Write for yourself. Um, don't write for publishing, uh, because um, you need to write first. You need to get it out, uh, you, you, and you need to um, you need to actualize some of the ideas on a page. Um, maybe later, maybe in in years from now, uh, when the machinery is going, then uh, then you could publish. But but notes like my own notes, I I don't show anyone. Um, Because they are uh, only I will understand it, and uh, it doesn't need to be in complete sentences or whatever it is. Is I mean, that's not the role of the of the of the notes. It's not for publishing. And if if you write in order to publish, then it's a bit different. Uh, then then you will be arranging your words, or you'll be you know, and it, it, this is not what you're supposed to do. You're 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 capturing um, disparate ideas on a page that occur to you. So that's the role of it. So yeah, for for, no, for, I, for I, you, I, definitely you right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, you were talking about fiction and non-fiction, right? Uh, I just received this question. Now. I think it's an important question. He uh, said um, something that make me hesitant to complete reading religious books. Or books by great imam and scholar by myself is because we hear that when we read that kind of books ourselves, we may understand it wrongly according to nafs or expect uh, affected by shaitan if we don't read with a guide by a teacher. I think we discussed it many times, right? So, do you have any advice for me 
I have many books on my shelf written by a great scholars, teachers, Aulia, of which I only read a few pages. Yep. Yeah, they, I do come across this uh, in the shop as well. Um, but the the response cannot be that you don't read um, because these books were written by these ulama uh, for them to be read and um, you need to know yourself uh, and um, it's difficult to say uh, but it you need to continue to read um, because um, ignorance is even worse I'm not saying that you're ignorant, but but what I'm saying is you have to uh, dip your toe in. Um, yes, the path is perilous. Life is perilous. Life is fraught with danger. It's the same with books. Um, it's all these ideas that come out and all these um, different ways of seeing things. You can be threatened by them uh, and they can be threatening but you need to journey into it. Um, best way is with the companion, of course. Ultimately, is the best way is uh, with a teacher. And I'm always reminded by what uh, Imam Haddad said in one of his treatises. Uh, um, he said quite clearly, uh, um, the best way for knowledge, I'm talking about religious knowledge, the best way for knowledge is for you to find a teacher to guide you. And then he is, he is talking about his time in the 17th century. He says, in our time, uh, there are no such teachers. So if you, do, you can't find teachers, then find a virtuous friend. And then he says, <laughs> in our times, there are no people of virtue. Uh, so if you find yourself without a teacher, if you find yourself without a virtuous friend, then Imam al-Haddad says, retreat to books. And among the books he says to read are the books of Imam Ghazali's Ikhya al Middin. So these are books that are meant to guide. And, and those who have looked into the, the Ikhya, uh, they know that it is written by, by Imam Ghazali and Imam Ghazali wrote it in order to guide you. And most of the, of the writings are like that. Um, so if you're open to that, when, when someone uh, walks into a whole library of uh, Muslim books written over 1400 years, he should feel at home. You don't want to be in a situation where you walk into a library like that and say, I do not want to read anything because I'm going to be misled. That's not the approach. Uh, you need to, to dive in. I mean, climbing the mountain is treacherous. You can fall, but you have to do it. MashaAllah, so beautiful explain. Thank you. It's, uh, I think it's a reminder for all of us. I think all those who are watching or going to watch this, I think they're going to learn Inshallah, from this interview, Inshallah. Um, just now you're talking about dive in, uh, reflective also reading, right? So is it like tiring at certain point or sometimes you just get lost in reading? And we know reading matters because you want to connect. And one of the times when you cannot connect is when you are not focusing. That is what, I mean, you said just now earlier, Inshallah, is through uh, you are in the presence of the one talking to you so <coughs> the, the 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 progress how do we endure it like macam for example for you yourself lah you read about i saw you lah you champion lah you can browse through do, 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 i saw you know uh, what do i say do, 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 then you say oh this book is what i was like oh my god ah okay okay uh, what what you were uh, what you saw was the different there are different types of reading uh, that's the thing. Uh, I mean, it's interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah there, there's, there's the elementary. This is, this, is the, this is what Mortimer Adler talks about. 
first there's the elementary reading, uh, which anyone can do. Uh, and then there is the inspectional reading, which what you saw I was doing. I was inspecting. I was I was browsing and scanning the book very fast. That's inspectional reading. And then there's analytical reason, uh, reading where you read for analysis and meaning. And then that one is slow. And then the, the highest level, the fourth level is syntopical uh, reading uh, where, you, where you read something and you place that book uh, in the whole spectrum of the subject. For example, if you're reading on the subject of the Quran and you take this book and you say, okay, this book is an introduction to the subject. And then you take another book and, and you take it and then you say, okay, this book is uh, a very specific field of, of, of Quranic studies. Uh, so this, this is what topical reading is. Uh, so there are very, very, various different types of reading. Uh. So to answer your question, most of what we are talking about is the analytical reading, which is deep reading. So this type of reading, yes, as I said before, in order to run a marathon, you need to do brisk walking first. And this is how you build your endurance. This is how you're able to build your, your ability to read. Uh, so this takes time. Uh, it's, it can be frustrating um, when you find yourself falling asleep or you find yourself uh, not understanding. Um, some of these writers, they use very long um, sentences and very long phrases uh, that we may not be familiar with. Uh, um, but we need to work at it. Because uh, some of these ideas are very layered. Uh, they cannot be expressed in point form. So we ourselves must be able to, to follow that argument uh, in order for us to internalize uh, layered arguments. So this does take uh, time and does practice. But what, uh, coming back to Mortimer Adler, mm -hmm. uh, who Hamza Yusuf quotes quite often, Mortimer Adler says that for you to improve, read difficult books. Oh. <laughs> yeah, don't read easy books. So don't, don't, because then, then you, you're just stuck in the playground, you see. You, you must always uh, read something that is slightly above you. Uh, so there, there is something in in the in the text that you is not immediately apparent to you. So so you have to work at it. So mm. that was Matima Ellis says read difficult books. Interesting. You mentioned about uh, Mortimer Adler. Yes. Someone just sent me a question on right. pertaining to him. So uh, this question uh, he's asking, I think it's also very important uh, for us reader to understand why reading matters also. He said that Mort Mortimer Adler mentioned in his book, How to Read a Book, that some books are meant to be swallowed <laughs> whole, while others are meant to be chewed. Chewed and spit out. Yeah. And in your view, should readers feel guilty if they read many books but don't end up completing them? How can we get the most out of the books that we read? Yeah, if you if, if, certainly you you you're not meant to finish all books, uh, and um, if it doesn't strike your interest, then why slog through it? Uh? Um, yeah, I, I agree with what Mortimer Adler says uh, in that in that regard. Not not all books. Um, uh, I have I've tried to read some of the classics, uh, just couldn't do it uh, because. I was trying. Uh, she Hamza was was in the shop many years ago, and and we, as, as we do, he tends to talk talk a lot about books. Uh, so he was asking me to to go back and read because I told him I tried to read um, Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky, uh, is a Russian uh, writer. So oh, I tried. Okay. I just I just could not get through it there are so many russian names <laughs> <laughs> so I, I i might go back to it uh, again but uh she hamza really loved the book and uh, i i wanted to attempt the book again so yeah certainly there, there are some books that maybe you're not ready for uh so it's, it's wise to put it aside uh, and then circle back when 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 you're ready or uh, when the circumstances are right inshallah beautiful um, in, in regards to why reading matters, right? And uh, how do we cultivate that in children uh, the, to show them, to, to make them realize at young age as they grow up, right? 
that reading is essential for them. And yes, they, there was a study done uh, by the National Library Board and MOE. Um, they asked children why they read. And the answers uh, were quite telling. Um, most of the kids say, I read because my parents tell me to read. I read because I want to get better marks for my exam. I read because it's all exam related, school related. So for that child, if you, if you imagine that child 10 years ahead, when he has uh, no longer living with his parents, no longer has school, what's the reason for reading? Because at your foundation already, you, you, you have this idea that you read. Yes, you read purposefully, but the, the scope of uh, reading is very limited to getting better grades or, or getting a mother off your back. So to answer your question is, I think to, in order for us to have, uh, to, to promote reading to children in a sustainable way, we, we need them to realize that reading is essential um, to them. But that's not easy to do with children. But what is easier to do is to get them to read for pleasure, uh, for, for, the, for the sheer pleasure of reading a book. And if you can give that gift to a child, then that child will be a lifelong reader. And when he's a lifelong reader, then he, they can do other things. Uh, they can read for learning, they can read for pleasure, they can read for, for language, for beauty, for truth, anything. So, but at the, at, when they're young, you, you have to somehow um, make them see reading as a pleasure, pleasurable act in and of itself. Uh, it's easier said than done, uh, given our climate, but that's the key. Uh. So, so how we do this? Uh? So it basically is to be led by, by the child, uh, um, what the child wants to read. Uh, the child could be interested in, in spy novels, or could be interested in, in murder mysteries, or maybe not murder, mysteries, <laughs> uh, or, or magic or whatever it is. The, the idea is for them to, to realize that they, can, they have this, this private universe for themselves and the author, uh, for them to experience this communion, um, this deep reading that they, they can have uh, with the author. But once they have a taste of that, uh, then, then they'll be flying. So do you think that, uh, is it a good way also that when they were young and their parents read the books to them? Of course, of course, that's, that, is, that is essential. Even before they, they reach preschool, even before they start any formal education, most of language acquisition, most of the habits of, of learning, most of the habits of retrieving information from the environment happens at the lap of the mother or the father. Uh, mm. And this normally happens um, when, when they are reading together a book. Uh, this, this is a fundamental importance to, to read to a child. Uh, in regards to this then, what is your view on the Imam Ghazali books for children by Fons Viti? What is it? What is the... That's a very specific question. Uh, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, uh, but okay, we put it in as uh, the whole children book at your bookstore. What, what, what's your thought? Ah, right. Right. Um, <laughs> children's books. Um, in Over the years, the quality of children's books, uh, Muslim children's books have improved drastically. Uh, certainly has improved quite a lot from the days when we started. Uh, that said, I'm not really strong in my uh, in my grasp of children's books. It's not my main focus at the bookshop. Um, 
Yeah, but 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 what I've observed uh, at the industry level is that uh, books have improved drastically uh, for children, and this bodes bodes well for 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 children, Muslim children. Inshallah. Uh, uh, is there a difference uh, between reading a book loudly and reading the book silently? You're talking about adult a, or children? Adult, adult sorry. <laughs> Switching. Yeah. Um, yes and no. Um, reading mm. aloud has advantages. Um, but for deep reading, um, reading a lot actually distracts a bit, um, because you because you need your attention to be on the on the text. Because when you're reading aloud, you tend to be very linear. Mm. You just um, move along, uh, whether or not you have an audience. But when you are reading alone you will read and then you go back uh, to you. Because when you read something, by the time you read the, to the end of a paragraph, you realize that you probably misunderstood the first part of the paragraph. So you go back and your eyes go back up and you read that again and to clarify, oh, I misunderstood what he said. Or oh, I, only at the end of the paragraph, you realize that the author was being sarcastic at the beginning. <laughs> so, so you don't really do that when, when you're reading aloud. Um, you tend to be linear and you don't circle back to, to things, uh, not only uh, the paragraph before, uh, a few pages um, back. So, so reading aloud imposes a sort of uh, a straight jacket uh, that you are supposed to read in a certain way. While um, deep reading, uh, you are allowed to jump in and jump out and even skip ahead. Uh, that's all important for, for comprehension. Uh. Interesting, interesting point. Yeah. Um, you know, Ibrahim, I, every now and then I went to, uh, if I visit the bookstore, right, there will always be a quote by you uh, that stands out, uh, that is very interesting. I think one of it, if I'm not wrong, right, you correct me, lah, i trying to jot down, actually, is uh, reading is not history. It's a piece of wisdom. It's often when I go there, I always see lah different different capture you put. That is actually to me is uh, something that I ponder lah deeply. But I never ask you, and sometimes forgot to ask you. <laughs> what what was that mean then? Is it because you want to advise? Yeah, re re young yeah. generation, or <laughs> you want to? Yeah, the uh, the reading is not history was is bit of a reaction on my part now because I think it was uh, I think many years ago the a lot of the people in the book industry who were feeling very um, disillusioned maybe or feeling very pessimistic about the future of the industry um, and this was during the um, the the rise of um, ebooks. So that was like sort of my oblique battle cry. Uh, reading is not history. Uh, it is here to stay. Uh, so that, that's, that's what I would do. But the other thing that I, I, I always uh, have, the quote is, um, the secret gift of reading is time. So the secret gift of reading is time uh, is a phrase that is sufficiently ambiguous that uh, people have many interpretations for it. Uh. <laughs> so, <laughs> at, but at the core, what it means is that um, the act of reading allows you to have time for yourself. And it allows you a sort of, gives you time to be alone with your thoughts. And it allows you to give you time uh, to give in to uh, the life of the mind. So it is the book sort of like gives you permission to Shalom. be on your own thoughts. So that is the gift of reading and it's secret. 
Um, because no one knows that you are actually uh, trying to internalize the ideas because the reader is silent and the reader is alone. Inshallah, beautiful. We need to do a Sidi Ibrahim Tahir contention. Maybe you can, you know, read through his wisdom. Inshallah. Yeah, um, there's one question that someone asked me. This just come in and because this person, he went to Warda, yeah. said, then he, he uh, find it fascinating in reading, but he doesn't know how to start. But you already mentioned about that just now. So he's asking, right now, Warda has a book club and yeah. he, he is asking whether is that a first good step for him to make an effort to start reading just by joining the club and follow with what's the activity of it, yeah. Um, okay, when someone comes to the shop and asks me, I want to start reading, um, what should I read? I will always uh, reply, what is, your, what is your interest? What is your intention? And what you hope to achieve? Uh, so the, the, the way forward is very individual. Uh, it depends on, on the reader. Uh, just like another example, a tangential but related example is, there was once a, a, a girl who came, or a young lady who came to the shop and asked me to recommend her a book because she's getting married. Thank you. And, and uh, I said, what is your main concern now? And she said, uh, my main concern is that I'm, I'm always angry. I said, ah. Then in that case, maybe what you need, you need now is not a book about marriage, but is a book about uh, addressing your the state of your heart. Anger, jealousy, you know, all these things. So, she went away with the um, purification of the heart by Hamza Yusuf. So it's very individual. There's no one size fit all uh, for readers. And readers come in many shapes and sizes and the, the access or the window into reading can be quite variable. So that, that's that. Inshallah, interesting. And I think- Oh yeah, yeah and, and you were saying whether the, you were, you were saying that whether this person should start off with the book club. Yeah. I don't think so. Because the, the book club is actually for quite advanced readers. Um, and the books we go through are quite, Deep. quite advanced. Yeah. Mm. So I'm not saying that you're unwelcome, but uh, it might be more useful for you to read what interests you at the moment because our book club are thematic. Um, so this whole year we are looking at um, Islam and other civilizations. So it's quite a niche subject. So, so if, you're, yeah, if you yeah. don't have an interest in the subject, then um, it could be a recipe for, uh, for discouragement. But we, what we do have um, every Sunday, we do have a silent online book club where you could read any book and you log in to Zoom and you spend an hour from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. reading together but silently. Um, a lot of people seem to like this idea of coming together. It's basically the idea is to commit the time from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. on Sunday morning. You commit the time, you come together and, and you read whatever book you have. So that seems to be um, a popular option. And this is an option that uh, anyone who is on, want to try um, uh, deep reading could, could, could do. Uh, there's, no, there's no banter, there's no one talking. It, it's, it's just people coming together in in one Zoom room uh, to read. Hopefully, after COVID, uh, we could 
rent a space and we could all sit on sofas or whatever it is. Uh. <laughs> but I don't know when that'll be. Uh. So at the moment we are we are on Zoom. Inshallah soon. So you mean that they enter the Zoom yeah. and then they just read on their own? Correct. That's it. That's all it. of them read on their own. Uh. So yeah. they, nobody say anything, uh, just read only. Yeah, there, there's a slight social element. They come in and they say, um, hi, I'm from Kembangan. I'm reading X and Y book. That's it. And then they read and then they, they sign off. So interesting. It's interesting. Yeah, it's it's quite it's quite a phenomenon. Um I actually got this idea from an Egyptian um library. The Egyptian University Library. I was talking to this librarian and we were talking about book clubs. And she said that her most successful book club was a silent book club. So I kind of stole the idea. <laughs> yeah, mashallah. Uh, there is a question coming in. Uh, you're talking about just now fiction. Then yeah. someone asked this question. He said, uh, I can clearly see what non-fiction books offer. Yeah. But can you share perhaps the value of reading novels? Yeah. And is there even value in reading books like Harry Potter? Yeah, I do see value in this, in, in, in reading fiction. Um, the one thing that uh, has been studied um, uh, and has been proven is that uh, reading uh, fiction helps us with our empathy, um, with our ability to empathize with uh, different cultures and different peoples. Um, and is also uh, like a like a laboratory of um, moral ethical values, because it's like a gymnasium where we could see what happens when certain moral values are taken to their logical uh, steps. So this would be, or it could be a laboratory for certain political ideologies to develop. And these would be things like um, the, the writings of George Orwell in 1984 or Animal Farm. And even in things like Lord of the Rings, uh, where you have this idea of, of the hero and the, the good versus evil mm -hmm. and all these, these things, uh, they, 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 they are important because they, these are like, um, as I said, uh, these are like laboratories uh, for our own imaginings. Mm -hmm. um, and imagination is important. It's, it's the way we, we empathize, is the way we imagine uh, different situations to be. Mm -hmm. um, so I I do feel that is 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 it is important. Mm -hmm. so and certainly that... in in our tradition, uh, fiction has always been is been there. I mean, we we often forget that the um, the first people to write um, fantastic fantasy science fiction were the Muslims. I mean, look at the look at the Thousand and One Nights. I mean, there's so oh, many yeah. things. You got flying carpets and. Yep. You've got, genies and you know, so it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's very um, uh, is embedded in our tradition and then a lot of the a lot of the stories especially if you look at um, Sufi stories a lot of these stories are fiction but they are they they embed a lot of teachings within them a lot of truths are embedded in them so I mean if, if you don't read um, fiction or folk tales uh, so a lot of these things uh, you don't have access to uh, yeah. someone is asking what is your favorite non-fiction book hmm very hard to say <laughs> favorite non-fiction book i think it would have to be uh, neil postman's oh, using book. ourselves to death yeah. I remember you recommended book to me before. I've, I've, uh, there's a compulsory book for all my booksellers. <laughs> um, yeah, New Postman. Um, Can you share why why is it you, you, you mentioned compulsory? That's a heavy word, you know, compulsory, wajib. Yeah, it's, it's an important book. Uh, it's an important book because it, it helps us understand the media. 
and it helps us understand how media shapes civilization. Uh, and the, the main thesis of, of uh, Neil Postman books is, this, this particular book is that a lot of public discourse has become entertainment. Uh, so politics is entertainment. You you watch the news in order to be entertained by by the by what happens in in America and Trump's America is is a show. You go there to to have a laugh. Uh, so that is what Neil Postman is talking about. And not only is is um, is politics now entertainment, but uh, sex is entertainment, religion is entertainment. Everything uh, is entertainment, and this is because of the medium of the of the visual medium of of television or things like that, uh, where where the appearance is more important, where the soundbite is more important, where the quick put down is more important. Um, so it shapes the way uh, society uh, society discourses with itself. So it's, it's an important, there's, there's so much more in that, in that book. Uh, but if you're asking me what's the, my favorite book, it would be that one. Inshallah. I bought that book because you recommend. <laughs> it's yeah. a hard book to read. Yeah. yeah. And it's, uh, I, I, after reading it a few times, uh, then it finally hit, come into me, I mean, hit me. And then I realized how powerful it is. And then I realized you always emphasize on this book. Then, and and that, that's the thing about about good books like like Postman's book. It it opens uh, new vistas or learning. So through Neil Postman's writing, I got I got into the writings of Aldous Huxley, and then you are in you get into the the writings of Marshall McLuhan, all these people who who have commented and studied on media. And later on, when when we read things um, from from other writers. You tend to compare what you've learned, so that, that's that's the other thing about about reading. It, it, you build on on what you've read, and and in a way, you because you read all these books, uh, these these books discourse with each other through you. So that's quite interesting. Uh, yeah, so, but Ibrahim, in your own experience, uh, reading. A lot of books and book selling I means the hull on the book is always there. Uh, what is the best time to read books? Yeah, is that for for me, what I tend to do is in the morning I read um, nonfiction or serious books, and in the evening uh, I read um, fiction. Inshallah. Yeah. Inshallah. So that is I you start with one thing and and, and I like reading. Um, I like reading deep books or difficult books in the morning because the rest of your day, you're sort of like thinking about the book when you're in that space. So that's, that's quite nice to be because it, because it's, I mean, daily life can be a bit um, of a drag. Sometimes you have things to do at the shop, you have to manage things and you have to answer emails and all these things. But in between, yeah, yeah. you can still think about these ideas that, that you, you read in the early in the morning and it, it sort of like lifts you up from the from the day to day, which is nice to, to have. Mm -hmm. Inshallah. There's this question coming in and I think it's also correlated uh, to why reading matters. Uh. And uh, <clears throat> I think this also, I think you mentioned about to me about local artists or local writers. So the question is, uh, besides title from overseas, uh, Warda book has a collection. Uh, Warda also has uh, local artists and scholars and writers that you all selling. Why is it important that Warda book showcase local artists or local authors or writers? on your shelf. I think you mentioned to me before about it and it's something to do with reading culture also. Yeah, because um, it's all about the ecosystem. Um, in, in the individual, as I said before, there is reading and writing. Uh, they come together. But when you look at the society and Warda does not exist in the vacuum. We exist within embedded inside our own community. 
And our community has people who read and people who write. So WADA needs to support um, those writers. Uh, um, because it is it, it, it feeds back into reading again. It's a whole ecosystem, it's a whole web of existence that you, you need to, to foster. And the it's not just um, writers, it's the book designers, is the book suppliers, is the journalists who review the books in magazines, is the booksellers, is the whole ecosystem we need to cooperate and work together. Uh, for there to be um, for there to be a healthy uh, reading environment um, there are there are problems uh, such as disruption uh, economies uh, where, where they circumvent a lot of things uh, where they go direct to the to the to the seller or they go they publish a book without even having an editor or a publisher or things like that uh. there are advantages and disadvantages uh, but the main disadvantage disadvantage is that you you don't nurture this environment you don't nurture this ecosystem yes it is slower to publish a book when you have an editor when you have a page designer when you have a cover designer why don't i just do everything myself but you are not fostering the community um, you're not you're not drawing on the strength and the diversity of your literate um, community so there's a lot to be said about this. Uh, like in, in, in the heritage of Kampong Glam, where Wada Books is located, there, were, there was a whole industry around books. Uh, there were booksellers, there were book distributors, there were printers, there were ulama who wrote the books, and there were editors, there were language specialists, there were translators. So many, and all this, all this existed and all these things were 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 sustained by a very um, strong reading public. So I've, I've, I've come back to this many, many times uh, that our society, uh, Malay society, uh, is a society of readers. Uh, um, don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Uh, um, because books were important to our community um, since, since very long. Uh. And we need to we have, re rediscover that. We have a long tradition, right? Yes. So, yeah. But the, the, the sad part also in a, this kind of materialistic society also, right? People don't see the effort of publishing a book. Yeah. And like what you say, la, sometimes the editing and so on. And then you will say, why so expensive? You know, like, oh, why you put then I cannot read. The book is expensive. Yeah. But they don't see the, the, the whole tedious. Yeah. Process. Uh. Yeah. Even including the rental and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it's quite, it's quite a complex um economy uh, books. Yeah. So the 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 thing about about this is that there's there's this very interesting book is published from Yale University Press. Uh, it's called The Reluctant Capitalist, and is uh, the social history of booksellers. So booksellers are reluctant capitalists. We engage in commerce reluctantly. Yeah. <laughs> because it's hard to be trading in ideas, um, but we have to operate in the economy somehow. And so we are reluctant capitalists. Um, and some people see, see us as only capitalists, as only uh, um, businessmen, as only... So it's difficult uh, because... We, uh, yeah, it, it is a business, but it's also a unique business in the sense that yeah, we are trading in ideas and we're trading in in this whole conception of this social enterprise to encourage reading. So mm -hmm. there's an activism involved as well. So it's complex. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for the explanation. <laughs> like, so Ibrahim, I think we are nearly to one and a half hours. Mashallah. <laughs> beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. Is there anything you like to say about why reading matters to those who are watching and who those who are gonna watch? I think it's just to reiterate uh, what that, what we have said now uh, that uh, do not underestimate the power of reading. Uh. Um do not underestimate the power of reading amongst children. 
among teenagers, among adults, uh, and and do not underestimate the power of reading in you, uh, because it is something very simple as we discuss. Reading is a very simple act; everyone can do it. Books are available everywhere, and it's such a simple thing. But that is the power uh, of books. Uh, books are everywhere. That's why they are important. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Ibrahim. Thank you very much uh, for accepting our invitation. Uh, Warra Books has always uh, been close to our hearts uh, and the hearts yeah. of many people, uh, people here and around the world. I would say wherever I go, they will say, Oh, Warra Books, oh, Ibrahim, inshallah. Right, so we have learned a lot uh, from this session, and we hope that Warda will continue to be the bridge uh, for more people to start to read and love reading. Right, then uh, we pray that Allah preserve you, Allah preserve your business, Allah grant you a lot of success, or even your bookkeepers. Right? So, thank you once again. Uh, see you soon, inshallah. Inshallah. Take care. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam.